Morning. Might as well get going. It's about that time. My name is Kevin Genuso. We're here to talk about uh, security awareness and social media. So uh, some of the security issues that are facing social media today and uh, some of the things you can do about it. Uh, first, I'll give you an intro. Um, I am uh, some, I claim to be some sort of expert. Um, I'm a senior network architect at ServiceLink. Uh, we do a lot of mortgage processing, foreclosure processing, that kind of stuff. So we take very sensitive information, FICO scores, um, you know, credit scores, uh, and credit background check, social numbers. Uh, so we have to keep that very, uh, very secure. Um, so uh, I'm also an information security consultant. Uh, I'm an old coot around these parts. I've uh, been in IT for about 15 years, and most of that time has been in information security. Uh, I'm also a Pittsburgh-based SANS local mentor. Uh, SANS is a great security uh, training uh, group. They're one of the uh, the only kind of groups out there that focuses specifically on security. Um, so I do some teaching for them. Uh, there's my alphabet suit, and I'm also a big Steelers fan, so go Steelers today. Okay, so we'll talk about some of the threats. Uh, these are really the main threats that are facing social media, and it's, they're they're pretty uh, you know pretty straightforward for basically anything that's uh, computer based, right? Um, availability, which is just basically the availability of the services, the service up and running. Uh, poor coding practices, which is uh, you know basically making sure the code is written securely. Uh, malware and trustworthiness. So you know some of the malware that exists out there today has been out there in the past. And the fact that social media kind of depends on, on the level of trust. Um, and then your real actual life threats uh, that social media can, can cause. And that's, that's an interesting topic we get into. And then some, uh, we'll focus on the corporate and uh, government concerns as well. So some of the threats. Uh, we'll talk about availability first. A lot of people don't really think about availability as like a security issue, right? The fact that the service is online. Um, however, all of these uh, services up here, Twitter, Facebook, MySpace, Yahoo, YouTube, uh, podcast providers, they all had uh, an outage uh, of some sort. And recently, uh, Twitter just had an outage the other day where people's streams weren't filling in, right? Um, Facebook had their own problems, MySpace as well. Uh, Google, right, they had a giant uh, Gmail outage a couple weeks ago. Uh, there was also... Uh, uh, some problems with um, the Google Docs and uh, all Google applications, and that just happened a couple months ago. When you think about Google, this is a, a company that's publicly traded, they've been around for a long time, and they're still having uh, problems keeping their stuff up and running. Um, that's an issue, because if you're depending on Twitter or Facebook uh, for anything business related, uh, you know, and, and the service just isn't there, Right? Isn't that an issue? Uh, you need those services to be there. If you, you have your email running through Gmail, right, and you're expecting to get emails from people, send emails out to people, right? Uh, you may have your company's uh, email actually hosted with Google because they do that now, right? Um, and, and suddenly they just disappear from the planet. That's a problem, right? That's a, that's a security problem for your organization uh, because now you can't communicate with your customers. Uh, with your other members, you know, whatever the situation might be. Uh, so availability is definitely, definitely a problem. Um, there's really two kinds of issues when you talk about uh, availability, right? There's service problems, which uh, you know we just experienced with Twitter. It was a, a Twitter issue, right? Their service, their their service had a bug somewhere, right? There was there was some code that was broken, some servers that were down, whatever, and Twitter just uh, stopped working the way that it should. Um, but then there's also the, the malicious attack side, where somebody's actively attempting to, to take those services offline. And a good example of that happened earlier in the year, uh, I believe it was like May or something like that. Um, there was a guy who was a blogger uh, from Georgia, and he was blogging about the whole Russia you know, incursion into South Ossetia, right? That, uh, that guy was the target of uh, attacks from a number of uh, hackers from Russia, right? One of the ways they went after him was they wanted to take down his Twitter and his Facebook updates because that's where he was you know, kind of putting this information out there. Um, well, he, they took him down okay, and they took Twitter down 
with it, right? They, they managed to take all of the Twitter down. They managed to take all of the Facebook down for everyone just by going after this one individual. It's kind of a, uh, you know, swatting a fly with a sledgehammer, but, you know, ultimately it, it impacted everyone. Anyone who depends on those services were, was impacted by this, this denial of service impact, right? So denial of service, that's a, that's a, a term that we use for these, these malicious attacks. Basically, um, you know, the hackers of the world have written these, these viruses uh, that, that create something called a botnet, right? And what a botnet is, is just a group of computers controlled by one central uh, entity or individual, right? Some of these botnets can contain up to 100,000, 200,000 computers at a time. And then once these guys have control of these machines, they rent out time on, on these botnets. And, uh, that's basically what happened here. 200,000 machines blasting to Twitter with garbage traffic in an attempt to take it offline. That's a denial of service attack. It's, it's uh, unfortunately a, a relatively common thing. When you have 200,000 computers whose only uh, purpose in life is just to spam and send garbage to another server or another set of servers, a particular URL or whatever, um, you know, they're going to take that service down. That's how it goes. Right, the most important thing about that is part of the building room or part of the botnet, so you just don't know it. Yeah. But that's true, yeah. The botnet software has gotten very sophisticated and very, uh, uh, you know, it's very difficult to uh, to remove. So, yeah, we'll talk about some of the, uh, you know, how to keep yourself from hitting that stuff a little bit down the road. Um, so that's kind of the availability piece. Uh, when we talk about bad code, um, you know, code has holes in it. It's just the way it is. Right. Microsoft's been writing Windows since the early 80s, and they still have security vulnerabilities in their code. Unix has been around since the 70s, right? And um, there have been a number of flavors since. You end up with your Linuxes and these kind of sorts of things, right? Um, they still have security problems, right? There's still problems with that code. Um, it's a very difficult and arduous task to try to go through every piece of code, every line of code, and every application out there and find security holes. Um, so that's kind of how you end up with these situations. Um, the browser, for example, it's your best, worst friend, right? It is your primary way of exploring the internet, right? Yet, um, it, browsers have historically been riddled with security holes. Um, you know, not to beat on Microsoft, but Internet Explorer, you know, every version up until now has had security holes. Firefox has had security holes. Safari on the Mac, security holes. And though all of those security holes you know, have basically allowed you to be able to go to a website that has some nastiness on it, and boom, that's it. Your machine is infected and now part of the botnet or, or something along those lines. Mm -hmm. um, and is it Firefox is better than others? Or yes. Uh, or catching that and fixing it? it? It really depends. The thing, the thing about it is uh, the bad guys want to go after the biggest audience, right? Mm -hmm. So um, because most people have historically used Internet Explorer, they target Internet Explorer holes. Um, but, but recently, we have seen some uh, uh, malware that targets a number of different browsers. Um, I have a Mac, but when I was going to PC, and I get annoyed waiting for this period of period to so many adwords by one of the blockers on it. Yeah. And I was yeah. like, <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, uh, but again, you know, if, if, uh, if I'm a bad guy and I want to get as many computers as possible, mm -hmm. I'm going to go after the PC. It's not necessarily the Mac. Yeah. Um, I'm going to avoid waiting for that stuff and get to a website because graphics are on different things or whatever. Yeah, yeah, or you're doing your weekly scan for example, with all your updates. Yeah, I mean, it can be frustrating sometimes to try to take steps as, mm -hmm. as just a normal person who just wants to use their computer. You have to take all these steps to protect yourself online. Mm -hmm. um, you know, hopefully, hopefully the companies will make that a little bit easier for us. Um, some of the, uh, the other bad code examples, there's a thing called cross-site scripting, right? And this has been really the, the primary hole uh, that a lot of uh, social media sites have experienced. Um, it's a very, very straightforward uh, security hole. The way it really uh, works is anytime there's an input box on a website um, that you type something into, and then that input is then displayed back to the user. So for example, your Twitter bio, uh, your Facebook profile, um, you know, a comments page, a comments section at the end of a blog. If those things allow you to type in script uh, that can then be executed by the browser, 
that's a cross-site scripting hole. Okay, and we've seen a number of security problems with uh, cross-site scripting that date all the way back to the 90s. But because social media stuff is so new, we've seen uh, the first cross-site scripting hole was actually exploited back in 2005 on MySpace, and that's been uh, really the, the problem with a lot of uh, uh, a lot of the recent um, Twitter issues and Facebook issues. We'll talk about. Um, the real issue is that extensibility brings vulnerability. What that means, what extensibility means is the ability to, to add on to the core, something that's the core, like for example, Facebook, right? Facebook has the ability for your, uh, other developers to write applications, right? Um, you know, uh, bolt-ons, plugins, anything that, uh, you know, expands the capability of the original thing, that's extensibility. And uh, with extensibility, you end up with vulnerability because now you have a bunch of other developers who are working on their stuff, work, working on stuff that uh, uh, you know, it all, all kind of orbits around this central core, right? And you can't guarantee that every single de developer out there that's writing an application for Facebook, for example, is following secure coding practices, right? If you were writing Superpoke, would you spend a lot of time securing it? You know, something as silly as throwing sheep at somebody else, right? Would you spend a lot of time making sure that that code was completely secure? Maybe not. Um, so that's that's kind of where extensibility. Yeah, you know, and, and that's that's really where you end up with a Unix. Uh, you know, it's been around since the 70s, and uh, you know, as it gets bigger and uh, you know more people add on to it, you you end up with security holes. Yes. In in terms of the add-ons, like. For, for IE, Firefox, any of the add-ons that, that they have. Do they produce their own add-ons or are they third parties as well? Uh, for, well, for Firefox in particular, that is definitely uh, third party, you know, uh, third party developers who are writing those things. And it tends to be that way for, for most browsers. When you write for IE and Aquavex, is can be developed by third parties and they can endorse them. Yeah, exactly. Aquavex controls uh, and, and even uh, JavaScript, you know, that can be run by all browsers. I'm sorry. Oh, uh, he just mentioned that Aquavex can uh, Aquavex controls can be written by third parties, and um, you know, the, mm -hmm. yeah, we've definitely seen problems with Aquavex controls that, that haven't been written securely, and you know, you type in the right thing into a URL, and suddenly you're browsing someone's hard drive. Right? That's not necessarily the best. I have a question on um, like download.com. They'll say, yeah, this is secure software. Yeah, it's a little, little badge type of thing. Does sure. that really mean anything? Um, it does, assuming that you trust download.com. And that comes into the trustworthiness part of the whole thing. Um, you know, the, the assumption there is that they've, they've scanned the software that they're hosting for known spyware, known viruses. And um, because of that, you should be able to trust anything that you download. <coughs> Exactly. They're not doing a code review. They're not making sure that this particular thing isn't going to, once you install it, it's not going to open up a, a security hole. If you check their fine print, it's fine. Oh, yeah. That says, <coughs> we're not responsible for our own this stuff's your PC, and this may have and all that sort of stuff. So it's, it's sort of popping up both sides of the mouth. And you don't even know if the executable has been replaced or you know, whatever on that one. Right, and there's there's been some open source uh, uh, software too, where these repositories that host open source code, uh, where those open source software sites have been hacked, mm -hmm. and somebody has replaced actual legitimate code with uh, something that has like a backdoor in it or, or something nasty. And they even replace like the hash of like the file, All right. and then say so you check the hash. Right? Well, <laughs> the hash matches the backdoor. Yeah, hash, exactly. So, you know, <laughs> must trust that, right? You know, again, with the extensibility thing, um, you know, you think about your uh, your kind of ancillary things that you might install on your PC, uh, Adobe Flash Player, um, Adobe Reader, so that you can read PDFs. These things have all had security vulnerabilities in them recently, right? I I'm sorry? I think I a huge vulnerability in years back. Yep. Yeah, where you click on, on this thing that should take you to a song in the iTunes store, and now, oh, wait, you just, uh, uh, you just got some nastiness. What happened there? Oh, my, I haven't backed my machine up in so many days, so you probably need to tell me that right now. Um, okay, <laughs> there we go. Uh, so uh, that's, that's the extensibility thing. 
Um, the other issue is that shared services mean shared threats. Uh, so any, any, anything that's a, a service that's, that's shared by a number of people, if there's a security vulnerability for one person, there's a security, security vulnerability for all. Um, that could be something where you're uh, hosting a website at a hosting provider, um, and maybe that, that service, they don't necessarily patch their servers uh, as often as they should, or they don't patch their instance of uh, WordPress uh, as often as they should, um, you know that that's you know and any any shared service that a lot of people are depending on, you know Twitter, right? Everybody shares Twitter, so if Twitter has a problem, that means everybody who uses Twitter might have that problem. Uh, then we'll get into the malware and trustworthiness issue. Uh, in 2005, uh, the Sammy worm kind of started it all for uh, for social media. Anyway, this was a worm that spread. Um, via MySpace, it wasn't uh, anything fantastic. It was just a uh, you know, little thing. Click here, and all of a sudden, you you got Sammy as a friend, and then Sammy's posting to your friends. Right? It was relatively harmless. It wasn't really hurting anybody, but it was still a vulnerability, a cross-site scripting vulnerability that was being exploited to spread this thing. Um, not not wonderful. Uh, then more recent ones, uh, we had the Stock Daily and the uh, Mikey Worms, which were uh, they spread on Twitter back in April. Um, they were one of the first uh, sort of worms that was written for Twitter, and uh, they both both basically did the same thing. They exploited the same cross-site scripting hole. Um, not much damage. Again, you you spammed out some uh, some emails to go to the Stock Daily website, and uh, you know. Nothing, nothing terrible. It wasn't like it was stealing credit card numbers or anything like that. But it's still an annoyance, and still, uh, you know, makes you scratch your head and say, "Can I really trust Twitter now? You know, can I trust links that I see on Twitter?" Um, Twitter cut. Uh, I, I like that one because that that was just a, uh, you know, kind of exploiting uh, our own uh, vanity and uh, will of, you know, our our need to have more friends. Right? It was. Uh, basically, a link that would show up in a tweet that said, "Hey, get a thousand more friends by clicking here." People would click there, and then they would send out the same uh, the same message to all their friends, and then they would send it out again in another hour, and again, and again, and again. One of these spamming kind of things. But you know, again, you're kind of you know hacking people a little bit there. Uh, people want to have as many followers as, as possible on Twitter, and uh, Twitter kind of you know jumped on that and said, "Okay, let's uh, let's let's uh, use that as our way." In. Uh, and there's been another one, you know, best video thing where, hey, look at this video, click here, you know, some direct messages. There was a direct message uh, warrant that just happened on Twitter like maybe two weeks ago. Um, all kind of using social engineering to get people to, to click on these things. Um, coop face. Uh, coop face got in your face and in your space. It's Facebook and MySpace. And it also went after LiveJournal and a number of other sites. Uh, Kubeface was definitely one of the more malicious malwares that was floating around. Um, it would, uh, when you click the link, you know, and it said, hey, click here for an awesome video, right? And you click there on somebody's Facebook profile, and you get a very official looking message saying, hey, there's an update for your Adobe Flash Player, right? And you click, okay, you know, I want to update my Adobe Flash Player. I want to be a good person and make sure my stuff's updated. And yeah, now, now, now you're in trouble. Now you're uh, the things actually actually would sit on the machine, look for passwords, credit card numbers, bank account numbers, um, you know, all the stuff that typical nasty nasty malware does. Um, and and we saw it, it you know, the, the, it was so interesting because it, it went across a number of different social media sites, and uh, you know, again, it was actually doing really bad things. It was one of the, one of the first examples of something. Um, one of the other problems that we've seen out there is, uh, and, and this was this tainted banner ads thing, that actually started uh, for the first time in 2004. Um, there were a number of sites that were hosting these banner ads. Yahoo was one of them, right? They buy banner ads from another company. And the bad guys decided to take out banner ads that were malicious. So if you hadn't patched your browser, um, you visited Yahoo at a particular time when this ad was being served up. Boom, that's it. Your machine gets malware and, and it's compromised and all you did was visit Yahoo and, and just download a banner ad that was sitting there on Yahoo's page, right? Not doing anything wrong as a, as a typical 
user, right? You're just using your computer like you normally would, but it's getting infected because uh, you know maybe you didn't install a patch. That's usually how that stuff happens. Um, and this continues to today. You know, like I said, the first one that they said uh, really came up about 2004, but this this issue is, is happening today. And the latest and greatest are these uh, scareware ads, uh, where you get a little box down in the corner. It's <coughs> flashing around and bebopping around and saying, oh, your computer is infected with a virus. And of course, you click there and download some uh, antivirus software, anti-spyware software, right? As soon as you install it, you're actually infecting your machine with a virus or with spyware. You have the credit card to remove the virus. Yeah. Please give us your credit card, and we will get rid of the virus we just installed. You know? <laughs> Unfortunately, my mother-in-law asked if she should do that. But that's, I mean, that's exactly it, though. I mean, it looks like a very normal, you know, error message. There was, um, I used to work with these guys, and uh, you guys have had all you know, We used to, there was one that came in, like, three weeks ago. And it was the best-looking fake antivirus software I've ever seen. It was uh, Nortel, instead of Norton. It had the same logos. Instead of saying, you know, by semantics, it's by scientists. It had the same kind of interface. And what they actually did is we actually, because North 2010, um, we had beta copies of it. That's what exactly what it looked like. They actually had a hold of the actual image files that Norton was using, and they referenced that in their code. So it was exactly Norton's interface with a totally different backing and scripting engine. That's and right. the, guy, the guy had already put $129 until he cost the credit card company, and they didn't max it out. So, uh, yeah, it was, I mean, but it looked so good that like, I'd look twice to make sure it was fake. But yeah, it was it was very good. Like, I was like I was almost impressed. I was like, well he earned his money that day. <laughs> I'm like he honestly put that much effort into it. Like, he, he and then there's sure. and then there's the ones on T V with is your computer slow? Uh, yeah. PC booster? Yeah. Yeah. PC booster, yeah. It's yeah. yeah. gonna boost your computer maybe right out the window, you know. Get you know, frustrated <laughs> you because know. it doesn't work yeah. anymore. Uh, it's good, good. and it's not an HTTPS. Even it's just a regular website. Go to our website, give us all your information, and we'll steal the rest of your information. <laughs> we'll boost your computer. I have a friend with XP on it that, that got that the, the uh, spyware one, and I went down. I tried everything I could to clean it off. Yeah, the virus is um, yeah. it's uh, <coughs> a combination between fake alert, um, Vundo, <coughs> and yeah. um, there's like it, the brand new one that it came out was um was just called like Rogue Antivirus. It didn't even have a name yet. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's how new that guy's was. Oh, it was uh, it's probably caught by the by the uh, yeah uh, standard uh, engine. The engine, right, right, right. 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 The, 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 the scientist one, and and I ended up just putting my name on. Well, I shrunk, I, I, shrunk it, I shrunk the petition down. Well, I didn't have time uh, all night to, to work. Yeah, it, yeah. Was yeah. it was days. It was like yeah. four in the morning, yeah. so I figured uh, that's it. I shrunk the partition down, put Linux on it, and actually put Crash Bang on it because it was all the machine. Yeah. And then it can make it run faster. But Something that works sometimes is to start your computer back up in safe mode without connection and run your antivirus that way. But that's assuming you've already got your antivirus updated. Yeah, the, the one one really great program out there is called Malware Bytes, uh, malwarebytes.org. Fantastic! It's open source. Uh, you know, the open source community works on it, so they, they kind of Panda's really good too. Panda's very good, and actually, uh, the the one antivirus program out there uh, that really sees the largest number uh, and catches the largest number of viruses is actually Microsoft's. Yeah, and yeah, you know, it's ironic. But yeah, it's ironic, but they have the largest. Yeah. You know, they kind of have. Yeah, they have their the, the biggest. Uh, you know, it's an install base, right? So they get the most samples sent to them. Have you read Ad Ledger? I'm sorry, say Have you read Ad Ledger? No, I haven't. Someone on the invisible cow wipe on your system train block Okay. Yeah, lots of crazy stuff out there. Um, <coughs> a lot of it comes from social engineering. I've already used this term, but it's basically ha hacking people, right? You're, you're depending on, on people's responses uh, in order to get them to do what you want, right? You ever read uh, The Art of Deception? Just going to mention it, Kevin Mitnick, one of the old-time uh, well-known hackers. Uh, he did uh, uh, a lot of damage to Solaris back in the day. Um, but uh, <laughs> in phone companies, the, yeah, yeah, in phone companies, yeah. So the Kevin Mitnick example is um, basically he pretends to be a guy 
up on the pole, right? Uh, he calls up the operator for some telco, you know, AT&T, whoever. He's like, I'm up on a pole here. It's freezing cold out, you know. I mean, I'm strapped in, and I, I just can't, I can't remember my password for this one system. Can you help me out? I can't remember what the code is to get into the one trunk, you know, so that I can uh, make, you know, get these phone calls working or whatever. And the lady's like, I'm sorry, I need your authorization. He's like, oh, come on, lady. I'm up on a pole here. It's freezing, you know. Boom, she turns it right over to him. And now he's in the, in the, back, the backbone of uh, AT&T's phone network, right? The witness line was, I'm not going to break into nothing when I can get him to give me a key to the <laughs> that's, that's exactly right. And that's what he did. He was an expert in social engineering, right? He was able to, to draw this information out of people, and he never had to sit there, you know, uh, plugging away with, uh, you know, trying to get passwords. They would just paint them right over. Yeah, yeah but I'm thinking of... Uh, CEH courses right now for super ethical hackers. I mean, they, um, the very first thing they tell you is like, the, your biggest security goal is going to be your end users. It's like the most secure network is the one that no one can walk into. That's right. Because, <laughs> because, but it's also the most worthless network too. Yeah. There's nothing on it. Yeah. 90% of the time, you don't really use your best to have a password somewhere else. On the keyboard. The sticky on the keyboard. On the keyboard or the sticky note on the bottom of the monitor or one drawer. You can use, I would tell us, like, you can use the. Oh, the plug-in advantage system department. We shared space with the firewall department. They were escorting with the firewall guys on, and they had two packages, and you can't see them. Just show them one of their weaknesses, and they're like, yeah, they can't that too. Yeah, well, yeah, anytime you want to try to hack something, yeah, you probably want written authorization for that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, unfortunately, uh, this kind of goes along with the point of social engineering, I don't know if you're later, but unfortunately, a lot of these social media websites that we use are in fact kind of training us to respond in the way that social engineers would like us to. Um, you have Facebook, which will say, give me your Gmail username and password, I'll go get all of your accounts. Great. Um, we have a lot of, a lot of that, you see that all over the place. Mint.com says, hey, give me your financial institution username and password, and I'll go get all your financial information, you know, and just, I promise I won't take any of your money. Um, <laughs> I promise. And really? you know, maybe we trust Mint.com, really? but at the really? same time, we're so learning that that's, that's an acceptable right. thing to do. Right. And uh, there's something called Open Off, which uh, allows you, when you have a service like Gmail, Facebook can send you to Gmail to type in your username and password, and then Gmail sends Facebook permission to get your address book. So there's, you should look for things like that when you're working with web applications, not just give somebody your username and password for another service if they don't, aren't that service. Yeah, and the reasons for why such things exist like that kind of makes sense, right? If, I, if I'm writing some new application and I don't want to have my own authentication engine, you know, I don't want to deal with storing usernames and passwords, why not just use Twitter, you know, and let people enter their Twitter username and password? So it, it makes sense, but you're exactly right. The behavior is that of what a social engineer would want somebody to do, which is entering their username and password in a place that they just shouldn't. Yeah, you know, the other thing, and I know this was first hand because my son made the paper a few weeks ago. Um, also, these websites like Facebook and stuff like that, there's so much personal information out there that these social engineers can use this to, to get it. What happened to my son yes. is that he put the internet hate machine, some, some decided to target him, went on his Facebook account, found out where he went to school, looked up Franklin Regional, found out the name of the principal, sent her an email to my son's name. They opened up an account on MSN saying it's going to be a shooting at the school oh the next day. Next thing I know, we're being roused by the police. You know, it's like, you know, we had to go to school and we spent the day with the police and the FBI about this email that some internet peak group sent on my son's name. So the lesson learned, though, is that he put different stuff on his Facebook account as a social media. They went on it. He befriended them, which he shouldn't have. And they found out all this information, and they were able to use it to get in a lot of trouble. Mm -hmm. so. yeah. the, the one thing, like, the biggest vulnerability, like, even if you don't give out on your password or something like that, is, you know, over-information. Yes. You have so many times I've seen, like, you know, you know, and I don't consider it hacking, personally, because as a hacker, it's not hacking. And to me, it's, it's, it's like the script kiddies. I mean, yeah. the person that hacked, Carousel's phone, 
Yeah. When her, when you could, I forgot my password. What's the name of my, what's your pet's name? Oh, Tinkerbell. Well, look at that. You, you watch any e entertainment news channel. It's there. It's it's it and it's like, here's your new temporary password. Use this to change it. And so it's like, I'm like, that's not hacking. But you have, you have to worry about the type of stuff. I mean, one of the things that like I do, you know, we can't get away from it because it always up like security questions. If they ask you a question, like, you know, what's your favorite pet? Put like, you know, banana tree. And then you know what it is, but anybody guessing would guess pet names for using any sort of dictionary pet names or some sort of dictionary or something else or these random generated keys. There's a lot of really great software that generate, you know, hex keys a little on your flash drive and then you have like the key file on your PC. Just put your flash drive and your key file and you run it and it creates a random key that day and your passwords change on a daily basis we can just copy this. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, but that's, that's a good point. And there, yeah, we'll, we'll talk about a little bit more of that too further on. Um, you know, a lot of people will post, "Hey, I'm out of town. I'm out of town. I'm, out of town. Address. <laughs> I'm going to Germany for two weeks." You know, and uh, maybe your friends aren't your friends. You know, you don't, you don't necessarily know. Uh, we'll get into that a little bit. So, um, yeah, just a couple of the other threats uh, with regards to account hijacking. Um, right. This is this is. Pretty straightforward, right? Uh, Guy Kawasaki, he was a pretty famous Twitter. Uh, he, his machine was at, or his account was actually hijacked, and he was spreading uh, uh, malware. Of, he has tons of followers, like twenty-five thousand followers, or something like that. He's a very well-known blogger, social media guy, and uh, you know, people who were visiting his profile were, uh, you know, unfortunately getting uh, malware from him. Uh, same with Britney Spears, right? Somebody hijacked her machine, what was the hijacked her account, her Twitter account, and, and she began spreading uh, you know, malware to all of her followers. Uh, again, if these, are, if these are people that you trust, people that you follow every day, um, and you, you, know, you kind of expect it to be a, a normal kind of Twitter account, you, you don't expect them to, to send you a link that's going to install bad things on your computer. So just something to keep in mind. Uh, and then the URL shortener issue. It's an evil, evil, necessary evil, right? Um, the thing about URL shorteners is, uh, for most of them, all you see is you know the bit.ly and then some string after that. Where does that take you? Do you have any idea? Uh, it's so why and then forward you. Forward you somewhere, right? Uh, uh, shorten, uh, tiny URL, right? All of these services. They must exist for things like Twitter, right? Because you only have so many characters that you can put into a, a tweet. So if you're going to share a URL, you're going to use a URL shortener. But you don't let necessarily know if you're just looking at that at that shortened URL where the destination is. Luckily, some of these places have started to resolve that. Uh, Tiny URL actually has a preview mode. Um, and there are some other things. There are plugins for Firefox, Firefox and that kind of stuff we're talking about. But URL shorteners is a necessary evil, but that's the evil part. That's why they're evil. Because you don't know where you're going to end up when you click on that link. And that's a bad thing. Um, some of the real life, real life threats. So uh, yeah, 38% of all social networking users post updates while they're going to be out of town. Right? Head to Germany later. I'm going to be out of town for two weeks. Um, and there have actually been uh, people who have had their houses broken into and all of their stuff stolen because of this reason right here. Uh, they let the world know that they were out of town and, well, the world came and you know, took their stereo or whatever. Um, uh, there's also the issue of social networking sites uh, leaking your user ID. Um, that's an interesting uh, study that actually just came out. And I'm gonna, I have a, a, a bunch of links to all this stuff that I'm going to uh, post up on my website. You'll be able to look up uh, for yourself later. But uh, the study basically said that when um, you know, uh, social networking sites make money by selling uh, tracking information about what people do on the social networking site, what kind of things they're interested in, to advertising companies. Right? But the study just uh, determined that when they turn this information over to these tracking companies, they're also giving uh, your user ID. Uh, not necessarily uh, your name in particular, but the unique string that is assigned to your account. Um, so basically, they're not just uh, handing over a profile of some anonymous user and what they're doing online. They're handing over a profile of what you are doing online. 
And that might not be what you expect whenever you're using Facebook, that that information is being captured and tracked and sent off to some advertising firm. Google keeps your searches for like six months and then you say what you're going to That's right. Yeah, that's right. Um, so just something to keep in mind. And then um, there are also these uh, aggregators out there. Um, you know, one of them is called PQ. Uh, another one is called Spoke. These are uh, these two sites um, basically go out and search other social media sites and develop a profile for you. And you never have to sign up for anything, right? You don't have to create a PQ account. Um, but PQ seems to know a lot about you uh, if you're very active on social media sites, especially uh, Facebook and uh, MySpace. That's where they get a lot of their information from. Um, Spoke is a little, is, isn't, I don't think, uh, quite as harmful. They're really just more interested in, it's kind of like a LinkedIn that's automatic. Um, but uh, it, PQ, I, when I, whenever I found my PQ profile, I was very surprised. I'm like, who the heck are these guys? And why do they know, you know what my Twitter ID is? Right? I, I never, never signed up for that thing. Um, one of the other real life threats is uh, just the whole issue of content ownership and uh, terms of service changes. Uh, there was a bit of a blow up about Facebook uh, changing their terms of service uh, with regards to ownership of, of pictures and that kind of stuff that are posted to the site. Um, there was an intellectual property discussion yesterday. I won't get, get too much into this. Um, but ultimately, uh, you know, if, some, if one of these services the top, uh, decides to change their terms of service, um, that could end up with uh, your what you think is yours, pictures or whatnot, um, becoming theirs. Uh, so it's just something to keep in mind. Well, I have an anecdote kind of on that. Uh, my wife runs a blog, and she typically blogs about political things. And she was talking about, uh, in Pittsburgh, she was talking about uh, there was some dumb stuff going on a couple months ago. And on her blog, someone commented a very outspoken gun rights activist that has posted lots of scary things about guns elsewhere on the internet on her blog basically you know taking issue with what she was saying and mm -hmm. it was fairly threatening mm -hmm. um, so and if you went to Missy's session yesterday you will know how easy it is to find where a person lives um, based on very little information um, so if you do run a blog just you know Take that into consideration when you're posting anything that's, uh, you know, or anywhere on Twitter or anything. I mean, some of the times I'll get replies on Twitter because I've typed something and some random jag off, like, responds, you know, with a completely opposite point of view. Like, I don't want to talk to you. Yeah, and how many steps does, does that person have to take to, to go to Google Street View and see a picture of your house? Yeah, it doesn't right. take that much. Oh, Google Street has to go Well, that's good. That's good. The maybe Allegheny County, uh, <laughs> Uh, public records does that. Yeah, they, they have a, a, basically a picture of every house in the county, just just out of the county. We have enough crime for the whole world. Murder every day. You live in it right along the street. I've driven past the car. Wait, did, you, did you actually see what they did? Oh, the new car? You saw it? Yeah, well, they, they actually did a really great thing up there. Uh, by the mattress factory in the north side. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Samsonia Way. Yeah, yeah. 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 Samsonia Way. They, they did basically a, a, a big long. Uh, yeah, it was like a, a presentation for the Google car. Like, so there was all kinds of little like sort of theatrical things happening along the street as the Google car went by. Yeah, take, take a look. The, uh, yeah, Google car in Pittsburgh. I guess. Um, it's about like people trying to find where you live, you know, just on the one side. I mean, I did private registration because I didn't want my house address up there. Yeah, so private registration is a good way to do it. private registration. I don't want to know my house right now. Yeah. Um, just some of the threats around uh, that, that are specific to uh, you know, companies and government. Um, regulatory compliance is, is uh, a big thing, right? Um, you know, the company I work for, we deal with a lot of financial information. so. We're under a lot of uh, government regulation uh, because of that. Um, maybe social media isn't the best thing to be running with my company because of the, the you know, obvious uh, ease of leaking that information. And we don't have necessarily a policy about that. Yeah. Um, you know, so it's, uh, corporations and government think about these things, right? Because they, they are legally bound to protect people's information, right? 
trade secrets, uh, information assets. Well, the other thing is people that are working in that industry too, and I don't know if it's the same, I mean, my industry or not, they get so used to dealing with that subject matter that it's not bad for me to say, hey, I was you know, working on patient so-and-so, right? You know, or Mary Ellen, you came to the hospital today, or, you know, thinking it's, you know, it's pretty important. I see Mary. Right, but they don't realize that you're releasing medical records or some of these things. Yeah, you just broke HIPAA and now you're, yeah. uh, and now you're in trouble for a while. Um, at Bettis, one of my professors worked at Bettis, and he could do his email, but he's not allowed to reply to it. Mm -hmm. And they say if even he can't, he can't like get my free email because I have the camera and certain features, and they have to put a sticker in the 3D cell phone. And, <laughs> yeah, so things like things like phones and uh, email and web surfing in general, right? These organizations tend to have policies about those things, proper use of email, that sort of thing. You know, don't put social security numbers in email that are going to be sent in the clear, that kind of stuff. But social media is kind of a new thing, right? They, they know, these companies have never had to worry about deleting, right? This is it's, it, and the adoption of these kind of sites is, is really taking off. So. Um, these companies have to think about this stuff now. But the issue is that if you block all social media, then your employees who are going to want to use it are going to figure out other ways to use it, right? They'll use it from their phone. Um, they'll use it uh, maybe at one of these proxies that allows you to get around the corporate firewall and go out. Um, so blocking all of it is probably a bad move because you still leave yourself open. Uh, if you block, don't block any of it, uh, then you're also opening yourself up to threats. So that you have to find that happy medium. Um, and it's really done with, uh, with a very good policy around social media, specific to social media. We'll talk about that. So yeah, the perfect formula for the internet jerks, right? Bad code and bad behavior and bad policy. Um, these three things in combination is, is perfect uh, because if they're, you know, they can exploit, exploit code or exploit your behavior or exploit the fact that you don't have a policy um, ultimately, you're going to end up with uh, a compromise, or you're going to leave yourself more vulnerable. So, some solutions: patching passwords and policy. Um, patching being uh, installing any update that, that uh, you're told to install <laughs> that comes from the official source, right? Not the one that says, "Hey, I clicked a link on Facebook, and now I'm going to update my Adobe Flash." Right? Go to Adobe site. They have a thing that will tell you if you're running the latest version of Flash. Um, Microsoft will release patches every month, second Tuesday every month, patents like clockwork, and install those patches. Don't let it sit there and, and, and bug you, you know, for the next three months. Um, Apple does the same thing, software update. They will tell you when you have a security update that's, that's uh, due to be installed. Don't put it off. Just install the update. Yes, the reboot sucks. Everybody knows the on, the, on the Palm 3, mm -hmm. if you do install it or second or third notice, they install it anyway. Yeah. I thought, I don't really like that. <laughs> yeah, a lot, of, you know, a lot of companies have policies set up that if there's a, a patch due, it's just going to push it to you. Yeah, you're just going to get it. Yeah, like doing the notice is not like the notice. Um, you know, with regards to passwords, you know, this is a really tough one because we have a billion passwords. Right? There's a billion sites out there. You have a billion passwords for all kinds of different things. Don't use the same one for all your, all your different sites. Um, don't even use a combination of three. Um, it's, it's difficult, uh, but if you can, use a unique password per service because then you're not going to end up with somebody is able to compromise your Twitter account and now they can get to your Facebook and your bank account and every other thing. Right? Um, as cumbersome as that might seem, to have that many passwords, there are a number of tools uh, out there that will you know, help you manage them. Um, there are some, uh, for the Mac, I know there's one called One Password, uh, which is a great tool. Put all your passwords into this one place. You have a single password uh, to get access to those passwords. It'll auto fill out forms for you. It'll sync to your iPhone so you can carry those passwords around with you. Um, there are a number of other, that's not the only one out there. There are a number of other uh, trustworthy password kind of collectors and uh, autofill, things like that. For Windows, what I use is KeyPass. KeyPass. And yes. it works really, really well because it, there's, so the thing I didn't like about those, one's like safe lock and things like that where they, they put all your passwords on those, like, well, they get the password to that and they're not passing everything anyway. Right. KeyPass requires number one, two things. You need to have the key file 
I need to have the actual exe. And exe points to the key file, which actually stores uh, the hash with all your, um, if you don't know what hash is, with, um, encrypted code that has all your passwords in it. So you run that, you have a password on that, so you already need, that's like one extra step of security. Then on top of it, you put uh, basically um, key fields in there, runs a random algorithm that generates your passwords for you, already in dot text, you can't even read it, you can copy and paste it in. Makes it really easy because they all just build websites for you and everything. The other thing is, the, the, the trick that I try to teach people when I'm doing security is, if you're going to have a, a, a password, you want to remember it. Start with your new password. Yes. Numbers, letters, you know, upper lower case. Then, once you get your root password, tack on or make this uh, a prefix or a suffix and say, my Amazon account, AMA, then my root password. Mm -hmm. So you're only using one password per site and you only have to remember your root. You know, remember, okay, I'm at Amazon, so I use the first three letters of Amazon, plus my root password gives me that. Yeah, and there's other techniques like that too, like uh, coming up with a phrase. Um, you know, maybe it's a, a line from a movie or something like that. Uh, you know, one we used to use was uh, from The Godfather. You broke my heart, Fredo. You broke my heart. You know, take the first letter of each, each, you know, each of those things. Maybe throw a number, an exclamation point in there, uh, just to kind of break it up. The uh, website, uh, web pages at suck.com, uh, suggested that you take a book off the shelf. Uh, find the first sentence in it or, or someone, highlight it, and then take either the first or the last letter of each word mm -hmm. in that and use that as just another way of doing it. Can you just and then you always, so when you forget it, you can always start back here, yeah, that'd be good. Yeah, I can use it. 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 I I would go with a third party. Yeah. 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 Smart card, which is five yeah. minutes, you can really have to do it. Yeah. Food. And that's a good pack for you. I have one last word part of the package. It's a different way to do it. So we just get through this real quick. <laughs> um, but that's better than just using it. With regards to tools, uh, you know, there's there's some tools out there, as I mentioned, the tiny URL uh, preview. Uh, Brizzly is an interesting new service for Twitter. Um, it's an invite only, but it's pretty easy to get an invite. Um, it basically uh, expands all of those shortened URLs for you. So you can see where they actually go. Um, that's a nice thing. Uh, some, of the, some of the other URL shorteners out there uh, also have a preview mode that you can set up. And Bitly has actually started flagging known malicious sites uh, that they, you know, so if you click on a Bitly link, um, it'll actually it take you to a page that says, hey, we've got reports that this, this goes to a bad place. Uh, so that you go at your own risk, which is a good Google thing. does that too now. Yes, yes, Google does that too. Um, you know, take availability into your own hands. Uh, so if you have a blog, um, you know, and you have it hosted somewhere, just make a backup. Uh, have, think about think about what you would need to do if one of these services goes away, right? If, if your blogger service goes away, if your podcast service goes away, um, you know, how, what's your contingency plan? Um, how much would that affect you, and is it worth you having a secondary site to stand your stuff up on, or uh, you know, something of that nature? Uh, <coughs> <don't know. coughs> Web of trust. Web of trust. Yes. That supposedly um, there's a Firefox plugin on that. It, yeah. It finds everything that depends on the, whether it's a Google search or anything. That's the little green. Uh, yeah, that's a, that's a, that's kind of taken off too. Uh, the, the Internet Explorer has a similar <coughs> thing where you're basically checking with the database uh, that says, you know, so X number of people have reported this as a known good site or a known bad site. Uh, definitely <coughs> trustworthy. But the anti phishing filters and that kind of stuff are out there. What about um, plugins for WordPress? <coughs> I don't know the process of those really being published on the site. Are those always safe? Good stuff. Um, you know, again, they're they're uh, you know they're, they're as trustworthy as they as they can. I mean, um, you know, they're they're written by open source developers. Uh, you know, 
these folks, uh, nine times out of ten, have your best interests in mind. Um, and they're good, they, WordPress and Firefox go through a review process to make sure that the plugins are actually okay, that they're not going to do bad things. The problem that you run into is maybe there's a security hole on the back end uh, that the developer didn't think about. Um, they could open you up by installing that thing. So <coughs> it's, not, it's not too hard for them to manage all of those plugins and find out whether it's malicious or not. Uh, I mean, the, the, the major, it's just like it's just like how Apple does it. Yeah. Yeah. If you if you Google the plugin and there's a problem, you will find reports about. There's yeah, there are some security sites that are. Unless it's a really brand new. So. I the name of the big one that goes through reports that this this particular uh, scripting has problems. Um, I don't know. One of my Links. I don't even remember which one it is now, but they will, they, will, they, they have to listen now that it's a big name, whatever it is. Mm -hmm. So what if some, what if a bunch of WordPress sites got hacked and nobody noticed that the common denominator was this certain plugin that left a loophole that nobody knew about? Well, I guess, I guess the, 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 the <coughs> thing there would be to make sure you always get your plugins from a trusted source. Um, so, for example, with Firefox, right, um, you can get them from the official Firefox site, or you can get them from some guy at the website, right? Always get them from the Firefox site. Well, you know, that's kind of my question. Like, can I always trust them you can from the Firefox site? You can't all trust You can't trust anybody. There's, 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 no there's, there's, no there's no such thing as always. Yeah, there's no such thing as always. If it comes from the source, then you can. that's your best shot at, at actually trusting you know, you, you, you can say, okay, if, it, if, if it's hosted by the company, yes. It, it's, it's a high level of data. You're only trusted if you're running from the CD. Right. So just, just, just real quick, I hope that I can see it. Yeah, purchased from the third mm -hmm. store. Just real quick, uh, know your service agreements. So know, you know, understand, know what you're, uh, if you're hosting uh, with, a, with a web service provider or something like that, you're, uh, if you're borrowing servers from someone, know what the service agreement says. They're allowed to be down for X number of hours, right? Their patching, patching policy is this. Uh, they will you know, fix their WordPress, fix their uh, uh, instances of Linux or whatnot, right? Those, that's that's how you're going to hold somebody accountable where you're, you're buying a service from them, right? Uh, to social media providers, fix your code, right? We've got to get rid of this cross-site scripting stuff. The fact that that stuff still exists in, in the Twitters of the world and Facebook right? it's just it's just a little bit out of hand. Um, so if you're thinking about starting a new social media site uh, that you're going to provide a service to someone, you know, do, do some background checking on, on what it takes to write secure code. Because ultimately, your audience must trust you, and that's why this whole thing works. That's why social media works. Is if you're able to trust the sites uh, that you're visiting. Um, a little bit of light reading. Um, I'm going to have a, a bunch of links to all the stuff that we just talked about up on this site. And uh, please send me an email. Or send me a tweet, whatever. Yeah, I can tweet the link for sure. Absolutely. Something similar to that. I'm not using the same password on all of the sites. Probably good idea not to use the same email at different sites. So you can just add like on an email that had something to it or for then suppose a little more addresses or yeah. Yeah, there are one time email addresses on there for some some sites out there. Yeah. It was even uh I can't remember the name of the site. You don't want to find it. sites like you don't want to sign up for a site. Like they have places that like make universal accounts for everybody. Yeah, probably yeah. not. Yeah, probably yeah. not. Thank you. Yeah, that's good stuff. I love that site. Yeah. Yeah, dude. Plug me on that topic. Let's see if you want to flip your own upload picture. You don't have to yeah. have your account or something else. You can go on there and don't have an open account anybody. Yeah. 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 Yeah.